That was be nice. <laughs> Next one, be content. Everybody say be content. be content. What does that mean? It means learn to be happy. Learn to be happy. If you think you can't be happy until something changes, you'll be a victim all your life. Amen. You know, James wrote, he says, count it pure joy when everything in your life goes wrong. Who does that? And the context is like having a party. It's like inviting all your friends over. We're going to celebrate. What are we celebrating? <laughs> My life sucks. Woo! <laughs> Why would we celebrate that? Because it's not going to stay that way. Amen. Don't get obsessed by what's in front of you at any given moment. Have some faith. Learn to be happy. Oh, Pastor, I can't be happy. You know, if I got a better car, I could be happy. If we got a nicer house, I could be happy. If I hadn't married that idiot and married another idiot, I'd be so much happier. <laughs> and by the way, listen to me. There's always somebody better. Are you hearing me? This is what's happening, especially with the young generation. You, you poor girls here. These guys have lost their ever-loving minds. And the reason they don't want to get married, you know what they tell me? Well, what if something else better comes along? No, I said, dude, have you looked in the mirror? <laughs> you are butt ugly and you're wondering about something else coming along? <laughs> There's always somebody with longer legs and bigger boobs and nicer hair, or some guy with more money and more success. There's always some, you can't always be chasing something that's better. It's all shallow anyway. Find someone, do life with them, build a life together, and enjoy your life. I tell people in my church, enjoy the road that you're on. Enjoy the scenery, enjoy the flowers. It might be a dead end. So how will I know when you get to the end? <laughs> if it's a dead end, just turn around and go find another road. But no, what happens? We run into a dead end and people just collapse. Oh, oh, pastor. Oh, pastor, we thought we did. And it didn't work out. So what? Most of my life has not worked out. I have a PhD in failure. What do you do? Just find another road. That light at the end of the tunnel might be just another train coming at you. Right? This is life. Are you part of life? Has anyone understood? This is hard. Just jump out of the way. Don't let the train run you over. Get all mad, crazy. And by the way, you single girls, you almost married. <laughs> Listen to me. Marriage was not designed to make you happy. And all the married people said, Amen. You think a man is going to make you happy? <laughs> oh, my gosh. He's going to drive you out of your ever-loving mind. No, pastor. He's going to fill me with joy. <laughs> man, stop smoking that stuff. And you're supposed to be happy in the first place. Everyone designed to make you happy. You know, universities, they study the stupidest things on earth, right? I don't know where they get the money for this nonsense. But this one university wanted to study the effect of smiles. So they went and studied a whole bunch. They got a bunch of old college yearbooks. And they rated the people with the best smiles. And then part of the study was now that we, they picked the 10% of the best smiles. And then they went and interviewed these people decades later to see what they were like. It was stunning, the results. They said that the people in these studies, they were so successful in everything they did. And what caught my attention? They said, we couldn't find a single one of these people who had been divorced. Think about that in today's culture. And they couldn't explain it. I can explain it because they were happy in the first place. If you need someone else to make you happy, you are a disaster waiting to happen. Amen. And what is it with us? We're children of God. We're supposed to be happy in the first place. Let the joy of the Lord fill us. Amen. All right. All right. 
Next one. Be connected. Everybody say, be connected. What does that mean? It means get some friends. Oh, fast. We have friends. I have my friends, and he has his friends. No, 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 no. That's not what I'm talking about. We all have psychotic people we call our friends. That's why they're our friends. They think as crazy as we do. I'm talking about other couples. If you are not routinely getting together with other couples and talking your crazy through, you are going to be a mess. Marriage was never designed to be two people on an island all by yourselves. If it's just you and your spouse on an island, you will turn into cannibals and you'll eat each other. (laughs) Get off of the island. Get together with other people. Talk your crazy through. I want the thermostat at 72. She wants it at 70. I want it at 70. Your friends might say, have you tried 71? (laughs) I never thought of that. We get so close, we can't see things. Right? And, and in this respect, the men, they're the guiltiest. You know what they say? Don't tell nobody our business. It's our business. Don't tell, don't tell anybody our business. You know, you need a swirly. Goodness gracious. I tell you, you're going to talk to somebody eventually. You might be an attorney. But you're going to talk big time before it's over. Get some friends. Get off the island. Next chapter. Be prepared. Everybody say, be prepared. prepared. Life is hard. It's really, 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 really hard. And that's why I tell all you people who are almost married. (laughs) Look, Look for someone of character. Someone you can do life with. Don't get caught up in how cute they are. Character will last you a lifetime. Sexy has a shelf life. It does. And some of us have hit our expiration dates. You know, it's just so depressing. There's two versions of hard. Sometimes life is unpredictable. There is stuff coming your way. You have no idea what's coming. You have no idea. Well, how do I handle it? Be prepared. Hence the armor. You're supposed to wear armor. Do you know why you wear army? Armor? Because someone's trying to hurt you. You know why you wear armor? Because the devil's throwing stuff at you. Don't be walking around in your bikini thinking, Ooh, it's going to be fun. Man, I'm telling you, there's stuff coming at you. Pay attention. I can't imagine some of you guys in bikinis. That's really disgusting. <laughs> you can't make stuff up. I remember my wife was going in for chemo, and uh, they made a mistake. I don't know what happened. Wrong combination. They gave her too much. Almost killed her. She crashed. They had to rush her into the ICU for days. They pulled her back from the edge of death. Because it just, it was somebody messed up bad. Anyway, they finally stabilized her. We're all, you know, concerned. Finally, on a Saturday, they they got her set and sent her home with me. (laughs) If you're sick and you look up and see me, this is not a good day for you. But anyway... (laughs) I took her home and put her to bed, and she's all drugged up, and you know, said, la, la, la. and it was night, you know, and finally things settled down. I climbed into bed, and she said, la, la, la. went to sleep. Next morning, Sunday morning, I got to go to work. Going to preach four times that morning. I look over to her, she said, I just got up quietly, went in the bathroom, closed the door. When the other little room closed the door, I'm meditating on the throne. At the same time, I had a younger brother living with me. His wife had kicked him out of the house. He deserved it. But we're Latinos, and Latinos can never escape family. That's why those employment forms are so discriminatory. (laughs) Nearest relative not living with you. (laughs) They all live with me! (laughs) Racist form, what is that? So when he was supposed to be there a few weeks, nine months later, he's still there. He's living in a basement. We called him a basement troll. He's all depressed. I'm yelling at him, trying to get him to snap out of it. Apparently yelling at depressed people is not helpful. (laughs) Who knew? (laughs) I had my own problems. Anyway, no one was paying attention to him because we're all all watching Deb. We're at the hospital and stuff like that. So he goes days without sleep. And he just has a complete manic breakdown in the middle of that night. 
In the morning, he comes stomping up the stairs, walks into the kitchen, starts yelling and screaming at me, th threatening to kill me. The problem is, I'm not in the kitchen. <laughs> I'm sitting on the can. He's at the, oh my God. My wife wakes up, she hears him threatening to kill me. She panics, she calls the police. You gotta come, go hurt my husband. So she's sitting on the edge of the bed. I come walking out of the bathroom, she goes, huh, what are you doing here? I live here. I thought you were, I thought you were in the kitchen, bro, trying to kill you. Now, I think she's on drugs. Because she's all, la, 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 right? And now she's hallucinating. And she, I, called the, I called the police. Oh, no, man. I was like, here, the cops pull up. Oh, we quick run out. Well, I put on some pants. And we ran outside. And the cop looked at me and said, sir, somebody trying to hurt you? And I look at the cop. I look at my wife. <laughs> look at the cop. Now, you know that look your wife can give you? That I'm going to kill you look. You ought to see that look when you're trying to tell a cop right in front of her that she's crazy. This is not a good look. I said, listen, man, she's on a lot of drugs. She's getting red in the face. As I am speaking, police cars come zooming down the road, lights on. They jump out with their weapons pulled. I said, what's going on? I said, he just called in. He said he's going to blow up the building. My wife looks at me and says, I told you. But now all I'm thinking is, oh, Lord, what do the neighbors think? It's Sunday morning at the pastor's house. The po-po are everywhere. I can imagine old people next to us looking through the curtain saying, I knew they had a crack house in there. Something wrong with them people. They eventually got him. Took him in to get some help. So what'd you do? We laughed. We laugh, tears streaming down our face. We laugh so hard. And she's sick and she's laughing. I'm not alone. If something like that happened to you, you'd be in trauma. You'd be counseling for a year and a half. Why? Because you're not prepared. It's just another day in the Gunger house. <laughs> Crazy stuff's coming. Be prepared. So number one, life is unpredictable. The other version is sometimes life is predictable. This tends to drive the female gender insane. Because nothing's more frustrating to a woman than having to revisit the same issues with a man. It drives them crazy. And they said to me, Pastor, why do I have to keep dealing with this over and over and over again? I said, because he's still breathing. <laughs> Hang in there. He's got to go eventually. All right? <laughs> Here's the mistake you girls make. You think when you've discussed something with a man, you fix something. <laughs> But as soon as you talk it through, he'll be coming round the mountain when he goes. And then you're going to deal with it again. He'll be coming round the mountain. And then you're going to deal with it again. He'll be coming round the mountain. He'll be coming round the mountain. Instead of freaking out, you ought to be going, you know, he should be coming around the mountain right about now. <laughs> so don't get mad about it. I love reading these, these, these interviews of couples. You know, they've been married for 75 years. I say, when did you two work out your differences? They look at each other, man, we ain't worked nothing out. Still irritates me. <laughs> you still want to get married? <laughs> if you can survive this, you're set, man. You're good to go. All right. Next one. Be proactive. Everybody say proactive. proactive. Life happens on purpose. Here's a verse for you. You will reap what you sow. This affects everybody. Doesn't matter how pretty you are. Doesn't matter how much money you've got. Doesn't matter the education you have. Everybody will reap what they sow. If your life sucks, it's because you're doing sucky things. It's just that simple. But we don't make that connection today. My life sucks. It's somebody else's fault. No, it's not. It's, it's the government's fault. It's not fair. Let's, let's have the government fix it. Yeah, let's, let's do that. Yeah. Yeah. They're really good. They're good at fixing things. Oh, yeah, they're really professional. These people are amazing. Dumb as bricks. If your life stinks, you're doing something wrong. 
but I don't know what to do. I get that. That's why you have the church. That's why you should be getting involved with other people. They can pray for you. They can instruct you. Try to learn life from successful people. But you know what most people do? They try to learn life from the people who are their friends who are bigger failures than they are. Right? Almost married. Don't, don't get relationship advice from single girls who, who don't know nothing. Don't listen to them. You go to the ones who are married, who are successful, and say, how do I do this? How do I deal with a man? How do I? And they'll tell you, because they know. They've done this. Life happens on purpose. It's not an accident. Next chapter. Be clear. Everybody say, be clear. Be clear. What does that mean? It means habla inglés. Be clear. Now, here's the problem. In every marriage, there's one person who's more emotive than the other one. Usually the woman, but not always. Oftentimes the man. But here's the problem with emotive people. They feel things so deeply, they can't imagine you don't see it. But listen to me. If you don't tell them, they don't see it. Now, because this tends to be more of a female challenge, I'm going to encourage you girls. How to succeed with a man. Number one, if you want something, ask for it. <laughs> well, if he really loved me, he'd know what I want. No. The problem is you compare your girlfriends. Your girlfriends can tell. Your mama can tell. Everybody can tell. My husband, I know he knows. He's not. No, he don't know nothing. <laughs> Men don't have ESP. We have ESPN. <laughs> Are you mad? You know I'm mad. I told you I was mad. When did you do that? <laughs> Remember we were talking and I went, <sighs> I thought you had gas. <laughs> you just sighing, rolling your eyes, flipping your hair is not communicating. Ask for what you want. Number two, ask more than once. <laughs> Ladies, asking a man to do something once is like never having asked him to do it at all. <laughs> Women say, why is that? Why do I have to keep repeating myself? Because we don't want to do it. It's really a surprise to you girls. Here's a newsflash. If we wanted to do it, we'd have done it already. <laughs> and why do you care what he wants? I'm trying to analyze the internal motivations of other people is wrong. It's called judging. Jesus says, don't judge. Well, he's doing that because he's a jerk. You don't know that. He may be doing it because he's a jerk, but you don't know that. Not to you ask and find out what's going on. Number one, ask. Number two, ask more than once. Number three, ask without insulting. Insult is not a motivator to a man. As an all oh, pastor, if I had a godly husband, I wouldn't have these problems. If I only had a godly man, godly. You mean like God? Okay, forget about your stupid husband for a minute. Let me talk about you and God. Now, if you want something from God, what's the first thing you got to do? Ask! Even though Jesus says he knows what you want before you ask him. But if you don't ask him, you ain't getting jack squat out of God. <laughs> Number two, what did Jesus teach? You have to ask more than once. That proves God's a man right there. <laughs> he said, ask, keep on asking, knock, nah, keep on knocking. Why is that? I don't know. Why do you ask why? It just is what it is. <laughs> and number three, we don't insult God when he doesn't move according to our timetable. Hey! Hey! 
See, apparently your husband's more godly than you thought. Here's an important one. Be doers. Everybody say, be doers. Be doers. What does that mean? It means you got to do it. You got to do it. The thing is, nobody wants to do it. Now, Chuck Swindoll said the following, so you can get mad at him. <laughs> but he says he discovered that when it comes to doing that, nobody wants to do it. Now, men in particular, they don't want to hear it. See, if a man hears the truth, it's just this wired in men. When a man hears the right thing, something says to him, do it. We feel impressed. We need to act on what we hear. So men counter that by saying, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it, man. I don't want to hear it. A lot of guys don't go to church. I don't want to hear it. Now, women, on the other hand, they love to hear it. Ah, oh, I love words. The magic of words. Ah. A lot of women are secretly in love with their pastors. You know why? Because he's so good with words. Ah, ah. But they don't want to do it either. They just like to ask questions. Here's an example. Give me a hundred men in a room. And I'll say to these hundred men, you need to love your wife like Jesus loved us. One hundred men will go, Okay, okay. Give me a hundred women. And I say, you need to respect your husband. You know what I'll get? I'll get 99 different versions of, what does it mean to respect? <laughs> you got a Bible study about respect? Can we do a small group study about respect? What does it mean? What does it You know what it means. But you don't want to do it either. Just like to ask questions. Asking questions isn't doing it. At the end of the day, we all have to act if we're going to get the results. Asking questions or hiding and not listening is not going to get there. You have to be doers of the word. Second and the last one, be patient. Everybody say, be patient. be patient. What does it mean? Just be patient. It takes a while to figure this out. Listen to me, almost married. It takes a while. You got to be patient. I'm talking to people. Pastor, we've been married for 12 months and we're in hell. Pastor, we've been married for six months and we're in hell. Worst one I got, two weeks. Pastor, for the last two weeks, we're just in hell. I was like, man, it should take you years to get to hell. How are you getting to hell so fast? No patience, these people today. No patience. If you don't get the right result right away, they just freak out. It takes a while to get it. It is what if you think because you have a wonderful wedding day and this is all going to go down <laughs> just smooth. No, no. That's why they never show you what happens in the movie after I do. Because <laughs> it ain't pretty. It's hard. It's hard. You got to be patient. Now, all studies have shown that women improve men. They just do. There's studies that show that married men are happier, healthier, make more money, and live longer than single men. You can take a single guy and a married guy from the same demographic, same education, everything, and the married guy succeeds more than the single one. In fact, they say the most dangerous thing for a man is to stay single. It's the equivalent of smoking two and a half packs of cigarettes a day. Isn't that amazing? I guess the worst thing is a single guy who smokes two and a half packs of cigarettes a day. <laughs> that boy's doomed. So women improve men. Listen to me, girls. Here's the good news. You can eventually get a man where you want him. The bad news is then he dies. <laughs> Because it takes so long. <laughs> Say, Pastor, what do I do? I'm at the end of my rope. Tie a knot. <laughs> Hang on. Goodness. Marriage is a dance that's perfected over time. You go to weddings and see everybody dancing. All the young people are shaking. Their, and I hate going to weddings now because they play music. It's impossible to dance to. <laughs> what the heck is this? 
<laughs> but then they'll play the slow songs. You watch the young people dance, they're terrible, horrible. They just grab each other and waddle back and forth like penguins. Because <laughs> they are clueless as the day is long. But then you watch the older couples and they're sailing around the room and moving. Do you know why? Because they learned each other's moves, you see. Marriage is a dance that's perfected over time. It's like a race. Now, there's two kinds of races. There's sprints and there's marathons. The most important part of a sprint is the start. If you don't start just right, you'll never make it. That's why they practice over and over again, lining up on it and coming out of it and go. Why? Because if you don't start right, you're not going to make it. People have made a terrible, terrible mistake today. They describe marriage as a start, as a marathon. I'm sorry, not a marathon, but as a sprint. A sprint. The most important thing is to start. Make sure they have enough money. Almost married, okay. Make, how long you've been dating? Oh, dear Jesus. Four years. And you're not getting married for another year, right? Yeah, if you're my daughter, I'd beat you. <laughs> Wrong with these people today. Waiting and waiting, slow waiting. Gotta wait for everything to be perfect. Everything to be perfect. Because it's a start. It's a start. And you know why almost Mary does this? Because her parents and her grandparents and everybody around them have encouraged. Make sure you wait. Slow down. You've only been dating for 18 years. Make sure you think it through. And you need to have enough money. Anybody hear this? Let me ask you a question. Who has enough money? I'm 67 years old. I look like I'm 22. I realize that. I'm saying, I'm, I still don't have enough money. If I had enough money, I, I don't think I'd be here tonight. I mean, I, mean, I love y'all, but... But, but I, th I, th I think I'd rather be on my boat. That's, that's what I think. So the one thing nobody ever has, we tell young people, make sure they have it before they get married. What kind of stupidity is this? Make sure you have enough of this. Make sure you, make sure, don't, you know, don't get married when you're still in college. <laughs> really? Every study has shown that married kids do better in college than single ones. Particularly the boys. They're finally getting sex. They can think about something else for five minutes. <laughs> finally getting laid. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> and these ignorant parents, some of you are sitting here. And grandparents. Like, no, 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 don't get married in college. It'll be distract. Dist marriage is not distracting. You know what's distracting? Dating. Anybody ever date? There's a world of crazy. If you think it's distracting, then don't date anybody. But if you're going to date somebody, fall in love with them, just marry the kid. For heaven's sakes, move on with it. Chop, chop. <laughs> Wait for everything to be perfect. Wait for everything to be perfect. And all studies have shown the people who have struggled the most in the beginning are the ones who build marriages that last for a lifetime. Why do we teach them? Don't do anything until you know you won't struggle. It's the worst advice. I'm telling you, it's the worst advice. Because here's another problem. Almost married is convinced that they need XXXX before they can get married. And then you know what's going to happen? If XXX falls through, she's going to freak. Why? Because she was taught by us. You've got to have X amount of money or you can't be married. You've got to have X taken out or this won't work. And if it doesn't happen, they fall apart. You don't need Jack. How many of you geezers out there got married right out of high school? Look at all these hands. This is what we did. The people who built this country routinely got married at 17, 18, 19, 20 years of age. We built the greatest nation on earth. But now somehow we've convinced young people they can't get married if they're young. It's absurd. Of course you can. When we got married, we were so poor. Good Lord. We had to look up to see how the poor people live. I told my wife, baby, don't worry. Someday we'll be poor too. Hang in there. Okay. Okay, I'll be. Someday we'll get poor. Praise the Lord. And we trusted God and we prayed. We built a life together. It was hard. Really? Did it bother you? No, we were young. We were having lots of sex. Hallelujah. Who cared? 
How many of your first piece of furniture was a beanbag chair? Yeah, right? Air mattress. It worked. <laughs> it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. You ever watch the beginning of a sprint of a marathon? Nobody cares. They're all standing around. Nobody cares. Do you know why? Because the, sprint, the start doesn't matter in a marathon. It doesn't matter if you start right or not. You can start in a marathon, fall down, have 10 people step on your head, get up and still win. <laughs> why? Because it's not about the start. A sprint is about the start. But I'm telling you, you've gotten the wrong information. Marriage is not about the start, almost married. It's about the marathon. Learn to keep running. And you run, you get in a marathon, they run, and they run, and they think they're going to live forever. Woo! And then they hit the wall, and they think they're going to die. Oh, and they keep running, and they get the second win. They think they're going to live forever, and they keep running, and then they think they're going to die. And then someone has them some Gatorade, and they drink, and they think they're going to live forever. Woohoo! That's marriage. I think I'm going to die. What should I do? Keep running. You'll be fine. All right. And finally, the last one. Be dead. <laughs> Everyone say, be dead. be dead. What does that mean? Listen, you cannot possibly read the New Testament and not come away with a sense that God wants to kill you. Not the physical you, but the selfish part of you. Pick up your cross. Lay down your life. Crucified with Christ. God wants to kill you. And there's no more perfect institution designed to kill you than marriage. <laughs> do you know why? Because you can't do it and stay selfish. You can't. And all marriages end for one reason and one reason only. Somebody gets selfish. One person, and it just crashes and burns, especially if they're unfaithful to each other. It's the worst thing that can happen. You gotta learn to let go and let God. You know, as much as we encourage people to trust God and have faith in this Be Bold for Jesus conference, we're gonna encourage you to trust God and to step out and pray and believe God for great things. And God will answer your prayer. But you have to understand something, people. God doesn't want you to get everything you want. Anybody have children? <laughs> Is it good to give them everything they want? No, they would disagree. <laughs> wait, wait a minute. <laughs> I think we should get everything we want. No, it's not good for you. So, Pastor, God didn't answer my prayer. Yeah, he did. No is an answer. <laughs> everything doesn't have to be exactly the way you want it for you to be happy. I don't want to be happy if my husband would start doing this or my wife would start doing this. Really stop. Learn to be happy. Die to yourself. At some point, we need to let go and let God. Jesus gave a parable. He said, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it will die, if it will give up, new life will burst out of it and it will climb out, into the dirt, out of the dirt into the sunshine. Boy, if that doesn't describe a lot of Christians today. They're planted, they're in the dirt, they're lonely, they're cold, they're miserable. Pastor, Pastor, I can't see anything. <coughs> Keep breathing dirt. What do I do, Pastor? What should I do? Die already. Because <laughs> if you will learn to let go and let God, you will get out of that mess. But you can't do it if you're going to hang on to everything you want. Don't be so tight-fisted. Learn to be like this. Learn to let, let God be God in your life. Because you're like, you think, especially the younger you are, you think you got your life figured out. You don't know nothing. I mean, I love you, but you're dumb. <laughs> How many people today, older, are doing something they never thought they'd be doing including this one. I never thought I'd be up here talking to couples. When I was growing up, nobody let me talk. 
was a pastor. I was <laughs> assistant pastor. They let me never, they never let me talk. They wouldn't even let me take the offering. <laughs> Why? He's not serious. He's not serious. God's mad. We should all be mad. <laughs> so I was, a, I was a piano player. Where's the last speaker? Is he still around here? Yeah. Did you say you're a keyboard player? Yeah, me too. Me too. I played, man. I played, but that ain't a keyboard. That's a spring box. <laughs> How anybody plays those things? Huh? Real keyboard, weighted keys, nine foot concert grand Baldwin. Hallelujah. <laughs> and I played, and they, they like that. So I focused on playing because they received that, but they wouldn't let me talk. I went 20 years without doing so much as a Bible study. No one would let me even have a chance. I just played the piano. Wrote music, started producing music for radio and television. Greatest claim to fame is I produced a piece of music used in the movie The Bucket List. But I was miserable. 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 Bleh. My wife says, what's wrong with you? I don't know, man. I don't know. Struggle with mild depression. Because every time I really expressed the crazy that was in me, I was always knocked down. Today I'm doing everything I told I couldn't do. Apparently you can. <laughs> People actually pay money to listen to me now. <laughs> you did that. Yes, yes, my grandchildren, thank you, by the way. Yes, yes. <laughs> a lot of us start out doing one thing. You don't know what you're doing. And all of a sudden, the end, life takes a whole different turn. But the more that you just surrender, stay open-handed, the more God will bless your life. And you don't know what's coming down the road, but he does. Put your trust and hope in him. He can make this work. Look, marriage, if done right, is the closest thing to heaven on earth. When it goes wrong, it's the closest thing to hell. <laughs> it just is. Right, divorced? Yeah, yeah, right, oh yeah. There's a trip to hell. <laughs> and and yeah, I mean, it's hard. It's really hard. You're a widow. She's divorced. That hurts way more than yours. I promise you. It's brutal. That's why I do what I try to do. Help people figure this out. Don't go, it's horrible. It's a horrible thing. Build a life together. Hang through. But God's not done with you yet. You don't know. You might meet some really good looking Puerto Rican guy. My new wife did. She was a lucky girl. <laughs> Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your truth. Lord, it's easier to laugh about these things than to do them. Life is hard. But laughing sometimes just take the weight off of things. Father, help us to learn to let go and to let God. Help us live the kind of life that new life will break out of us and we'll climb through the dirt of this world and into the sunshine of your glorious grace and people around us will say man how do you guys do that and it'll give an opportunity for us to share with them the great grace that you have given to us for your glory in Jesus name we pray bless all these wonderful people here tonight in Jesus name everybody said amen, amen. God bless you guys thank you very much bless you <laughs>